Okay, today we're looking at uh, John Searle's uh, cluster theory of meaning for proper names. Um, and uh, th the thing about this theory, this cluster theory for proper names, is it raises very sharply, uh, and it's, it raises in a very simple, um, exact way, questions about the relation between language as the property of an individual speaker and language as the property of the community. Um, at the end today, I'll try and bring out how this issue connects up to these problems about informative identities that we were looking at. These are really hard problems about informative identities. And the more you think about them, the deeper they seem. They still um, are not sorted out today. Um, but let's start out with this question about Language as the property of a society versus language as something to do with the individual. When you watch a child learning language, it's very natural to think uh, what's going on here is that the child is taking on board something that exists antecedently to it. What the child is doing is taking on board something that's a joint social construction, the, pr the product of many generations of work. And the way the child takes on board that language is what's giving it um, the capacity to think at all. You only have your capacity to think at all because you've taken on board some of the shared language. That's what thinking is. So it's essentially an individual participating in a collective enterprise. Um, a bit like um, having an economy and having money. It's not as if each of us can individually have money and then we kind of think, well, wouldn't it be good to get together and um, swap our money and things around? Money is essentially something social unless you have a society um, you, uh, that all is, are using money. You, you, you can't do it. You can't do money on your own. Robinson Crusoe on a desert island has no use for money. You can't have money. It makes no sense. Um, and it's natural to think language is like that. You come to have a mind only by taking on board some portion of the shared language. And if you think of it like that, then thought is the interiorization of language. Thought is just what you do when you take on board a bit of this ongoing social institution. I mean, of course, you can juggle with your thoughts in private without letting anyone know what's going on. And similarly, you can juggle with your money in private without letting anyone else know what's going on. But <laughs> you might not tell anyone about your tax returns, for example. Um, but um, still in all, what you're doing there is doing something private non-viewable, that is essentially involving some public uh, commodity. Um, alternatively, though, and th th that's, although I say that's a natural and very powerful perspective to have on language, is not actually the standard view in cognitive science and linguistics today. An alternative and um, natural view is that you should think also a natural view is that you should think of language as essentially an individual matter. After all, when you think, what are the drivers of language? Well, it's got to be the individual brains. I mean, each individual brain has to be playing its role in driving the social construct of language. So each of us has on their own to, uh, to have their own individual grasp of the language. You and I can understand the language in different ways. If you come from somewhere different to where I do, your language may be quite different. Um, it may be more or less different, and we may have to negotiate a bit. Oh, by this you mean that. Um, we may have to talk around a bit what we mean by individual words. And then when you think of it like that, the shared language, the language that, say, all English speakers have in common from New Zealand to... Um, uh, Scotland, um, uh, that's really just a matter of overlapping individual ways of talking. 
there isn't really a prior construct there. What all that happens is that we aim to have reasonable conformity with each other in the way we talk. Um, an extreme version of this view was given by Lewis Carroll in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Um, when I, is that Alice in Wonderland or Alice in the Looking Glass? Look? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, um, I, I will look up the reference. Um, well, when I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in a rather, it's, it's through the looking glass. Um, when I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I use it to mean, neither more nor less. You get to decide what your words mean. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. And Humpty Dumpty replied, the question is, which is to be master? And that's all. And that's really a basic question. Um, can you really have that individual authority over the meanings of all the words you use? There's one perspective in which you do. Uh, it's only that for practical purposes, it's useful to bring that into line with it, what everybody else says. On the other hand, the alternative perspective is, you no more have authority over what all the individual words you use mean than you do over what the individual pieces of money you use are worth. That's not in your own individual control. Um, you just have to go along with what everyone else in society uh, is doing on that. Okay. Now, where Frege stands in this issue is kind of interesting and difficult to pin down. Frege says, on the face of it, Frege spends a lot of time emphasizing the objectivity, the communicability of language. So he's really separating language from anything to do with ideas or the stream of ex individual experience, as we were talking about last time. Here, sorry about that. Someone told me I should just fold this. Well, <laughs> sorry? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Cautiously. Okay. <laughs> I think the microphone is good. Uh, well, we'll try it. Okay. Um, the sign sense may be the common property of many and therefore is not a part or mode of the individual mind. That's Frege. For one can hardly deny that mankind has a common store of thoughts which is transmitted from one generation to another. Okay, that looks like he's stating um, a version of the strong social view of language. What he's talking about when he's talking about sense and informativeness, well, at first sight, you might think, this notion of sense, your way of being given the object, your take on the object, um, that's going to be one-sided and dependent from the standpoint of observation. But Frigg is still saying there's a sense in which that's objective. Although it's a perspective on the object, it's a perspective that can, in principle, be occupied by anyone um, like uh, that uh, analogy of the telescope with the object glass in the middle of the telescope, which is giving you just one perspective in the object, but still it's a perspective that anyone can use. Still, th then when you look in detail what he says about the sense of a name like Aristotle, um, in the case of an actual proper name such as Aristotle, Opinions as to the sense might di be different, might differ. So you might associate a different sense with the term than I do. The sense might, for example, be taken to be the pupil of Plato and teacher of Alexander the Great. And anybody who does this, so this is still Frege, will attach another sense to the sentence, Aristotle was born in Stagira, then will a man who takes as the sense of the name the teacher of, the or teacher of Alexander the Great, who was born in Stagira. So now it looks as if each of us is individually assigning senses to the name. So we're each 
how should I say, breathing life into the system of signs on our own. It's just that there is this practical responsibility on us to bring uh, our uses of language into alignment with one another. And then there's that remark I quoted last time. So long as the reference remains the same, such variations of sense, sense may be tolerated, although they're to be avoided in the theoretical structure of a demonstrative science and ought not to occur in a perfect, <laughs> perfect language. Well, okay. And how deep a commitment is there here really to the social character of language? It looks like he's just saying we should each just bring our individual languages into line with one another. And it's not clear what perfect means. I mean, perfect looks like it just means, um, well, it will maximize communication, something like that, Ma minimize the, difficult, the danger of misunderstanding one another. If that's all it means, then he doesn't actually have any deep commitment to the social character of language. He just wants us to bring, to bring our individual languages into line with one another. Okay, so that's the background issue here. Is language essentially social or is language essentially individual and there are just practical advantages to bringing our individual idiolects into line with one another? Do you have any immediate hunches on that? Okay. Okay. Um, well, Searle, on the face of it, takes quite a strong line in this. Searle says, all right, let's suppose that names are associated with descriptions. Let's suppose that it's right to say that a name like Aristotle or Bill Clinton or um, Mitt Romney is associated with a description. Who does the associating? Who does the lifting here? Who ties up the name to the description? Is it something you do as an individual or is it something you do only as a society. Frege seems to be suggesting it's something done by the individual. Frege is, uh, is giving up, sorry. Frege seems to be saying it's something done by the individual. When you look at Serrell, he's saying quite clearly it's something done by society. Frege is saying in a perfect language, each of us is going to have associated with each name exactly one description and it'll be the same for everyone. But if you do it like that, if that's the right picture of what's going on, then why would you bother having names at all? Why not just use descriptions? Um, there's one seat over there. Uh, is that one right in the corner? No. I mean, if, if all you're going to do in a perfect language is for each description you have, tie it up to a name, now, there doesn't seem to be any need for names. I mean, it would be better just to use the descriptions. And admittedly, some descriptions might be a bit long, so you might have a, 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 a name as a short form, but that would be it. There would be no more basic distinction between names and descriptions than that. This is not how Searle proceeds. Searle says, suppose we ask users of the name Aristotle to say what they regard a certain essential and established facts about him, their answers would be a set of uniquely referring descriptive statements. So you're looking at what the users, plural, are doing here. And that's how you get the cluster of descriptions associated with Aristotle. I mean, you might not ask just anyone. You might say, well, let's ask regular people. But you might think, well, there's some special weight goes in what experts say about who the name Aristotle, uh, 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 what, what descriptions you associate with the name Aristotle. I mean, most of us would say, well, I don't know that much about Aristotle. You should ask, really ask someone in classics. Um, that's where you'll find out. And with most names, you might say, well, really, I, I know a little bit about Mitt Romney, but for a full description, you should really ask some uh, politics junkie. Um, with most names, you'd want to um, say, 
everyone in the community gets a vote, but not all votes are equal as to who, who this name, as, as, as to what descriptions we associate with the name. And Searle says, however exactly this goes, you draw on the whole community in giving due weight to the fact that some people are regarded as experts. And uh, you get that cluster of description associated with the name from the whole community, and that's what fixes the reference of the name. So there might be some room for negotiation here, some indeterminacy about which descriptions are in this cluster. If you say, uh, if some people say, well, Aristotle was Roman, um, should that go in? You know, do you just say, well, <laughs> what do they know? Um, uh, they get outvoted by everyone else. There might be some um, indeterminacy as to who you call an expert who you count as an expert on Mitt Romney, for example, and how many of those descriptions an object has to match. I mean, could it turn out that Aristotle was, after all, Roman? Um, it's just that we, we, we'd, we, we'd all along been making a mistake as to when he lived. Or would that show that there was no such person as Aristotle? I mean, it might not be quite definite uh, which way it goes, but anyway, What's going on is that if you want to understand how the name works, what you do is this social exercise. You draw on what everyone in the society thinks, and you get your bag, your dossier of descriptions from that. And the point of this, Cell says, this is why, is when you realize what's going on with names is that each name is being associated in the society with a kind of loose bag of descriptions, and no one individual is authoritative as to which descriptions are in the bag, is when you understand that that's what's going on, that you see why we have names at all. Um, names are not functioning as descriptions. They are loose pegs on which to hang descriptions. You have your big loose bag of descriptions drawn from everyone in the society. No one individual needs to know all of them. But what we do is we peg that with a single name, the same for everyone. So that looseness of the criteria for proper names, that looseness in which descriptions are in the bag, is actually what makes names such a good thing. It's what makes names so valuable to our use of language. It means that you just don't have to have decided right at the start well, is Aristotle definitely Greek, or could it turn out that he was Roman? Um, that's what isolates the referring function from the describing function of language. If you uh, describe someone as a uh, Greek, well, to meet that description, they have to be Greek. Um, just describing someone as Aristotle doesn't give you any commitment like that. So this is a way, this is a very simple way in which in your individual use of language, you can be essentially drawing on the resources of the whole society. This is a very simple example of the kind of view that says the social language comes first and the individual mind just takes advantage of what is going on in that whole uh, group. On a view like this, Humpty Dumpty is just wrong. You don't get to decide for yourself what the name Aristotle stands for. In understanding the name Aristotle, the, the, the whole way a name works is as a peg for a socially generated dossier of descriptions to be associated with it. Here's Searle again. The uniqueness and immense pragmatic convenience of proper names in our language lies precisely in the fact that they enable us to refer publicly to objects. That first two, I think I just typed mistakenly, lies precisely in the fact that they enable us to refer publicly to objects without being forced to raise issues and come to agreement on what descriptive characteristics exactly constitute the identity of the object. I'm a hardline Republican. I associate a quite different set of descriptions with the name Mitt Romney than um, someone who's a hardline Democrat. That's just fine. It doesn't really matter 
that we individually associate different descriptions with the name. Um, what's the, the great thing is, is that the society is generating the same bag of descriptions across the society, and each of us can just tag that bag of descriptions with the same name. Okay. So that's cell theory. That's a cluster theory. Yes? Are the descriptions completely arbitrary or is there some public agreement on what they are? Yeah. Uh, if individuals, oh I see, if each individual just arbitrarily attaches a whole bunch of descriptions to a name, then it should not be public. Yeah, um, I think that's right. I mean, it would be very weird if... Um, you, uh, yeah, you, you, you associate your descriptions with the name Romney, I associate my descriptions with the name Romney, and gee whiz, it turns out that there's some congruence between them. Yeah. Yeah. There must be more to it than that. There's something bringing us into harmony. Um, what about this kind of picture? Um, each of us, as we go through life, if you just take names of people uh, to start out with, each of us, as we go through life, is radiating information about ourselves into the community. Some of us generate more than others, but most of us, <laughs> I mean, if you're well known enough to have a name, then you must have generated a little bit of interest. You must have generated a little bit of information into the community. So you might think of the descriptions you're getting as the product of that kind of information generation by a single individual. I mean, presumably that's what actually goes on. Uh, that's my main point today, how this ties into informativeness. But just not to make a mystery of what I'll tell you right now, of what my main point is, is that informativeness seems to be an individual matter. Yeah. So if you take uh, as basic this social use of language, it's actually very difficult to see what characterization you can give of this distinction between informative and uninformative identities. Because um, informative versus uninformativeness, that's not a distinction that's drawn at the level of the society. That's drawn at the level of the individual. Um, but how then, uh, well, the point was, if you've got an uninformative identity, the, the point I was making, I can't remember now if it was last time or the time before last, was if you have an uninformative identity, if sameness of sense is enough to guarantee sameness of reference, then the sense that the individual is grasping must be enough to guarantee sameness of reference. But in this social picture, um, how can that be? Because nothing at the level of the individual is what fixes reference at all. Reference is being fixed at the level of society. Is that addressing your question? Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll try and say more about that in a minute. Can different individuals get the same sense for the same end? Yeah. 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 Well, we're actually going to spend a little time on, on questions in just that area the, uh, uh, today and next week. Uh, and today and what day is today? Monday. Today and on Wednesday. Um, assuming today is Monday. Um, I'm sorry, some questions I know the answer to, some I'm not so sure about. <laughs> um, sorry? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, I, I don't, I, you know, he didn't put it quite like that, of course. I mean, this is 1959 or something, right? Um, but uh, that's actually not a bad way of putting it. 
that if you want to know the, the cluster of descriptions associated with a name, Wikipedia would not be a bad place to start. I mean, you wouldn't want to stop there, of course, because a Wikipedia entry can be hijacked. Can't it? Sorry? They check it a lot. Okay. Um, so it's not that exactly that Wikipedia is definitive, but um, it can't, that catches the spirit of the idea. The sense of something at the level of Wikipedia. And of course, the whole thing about Wikipedia is the whole is greater than any of the parts. Yeah, the, the whole idea is that no one user is authoritative about what's in the entry. Yeah. That's what's catching. That, that's what we do about suggestion. Okay. Well, one thing that's great about Searle's approach is whenever you've got a proper name, if you, if it's supposed, let, let me just stick with that example of Mitt Romney. If you say Mitt Romney, um, tell me something about Mitt Romney. I don't, I don't wish to be making political remarks the whole time either, but I want to be using well-known names. Mitt Romney said corporations are people. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm just looking for a chair. I can't see it. Um, okay, so Mitt Romney said corporations are people. Now, the thing is, that might well be a description, one of the descriptions that helps fix the reference of the town. That might be one of the descriptions we associate with the name. But it's not a priori that Mitt Romney said that corporations are people. You don't know that just by knowing, the, by understanding the name. And it might turn out not to be true. Yeah, I mean, it might turn out that's just not so at all. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to undermine your credibility, <laughs> but uh, th that could happen. You can make sense of that, finding out that it was some aide who said it and the remark was um, mistakenly attributed to him. And that really could, in principle, happen for any description you associate with the name. He might turn out never to have really re registered as a Republican. Yeah, I mean, of course, this kind of stuff gets a little bit implausible, but it's not a priori false. It's not like saying two plus two is five. Um, so any description that you associate with a name, it might turn out that that description did not apply to the thing you were talking about. I mean, intuitively, it feels like the name just tags the object. The name doesn't say anything about the object. The name's just a tag for that thing. So any descriptive material that you um, associate with the object, it might turn out that, the, that that's not true of the object. Um, whereas in Frege's picture, if you associate with the name Aristotle, the sense, the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira, then you can't be wrong about that. That's a priori on Frege's picture. But of course, once you think about really how we use names, the name Aristotle is just a tag for <laughs> this guy. It might turn out that description is not true of Aristotle. There's no one privileged um, description that's true of Aristotle at all. And Sell's picture gets that because all you've got associated with the name is this loose rag bag of descriptions. So if a name is getting tied up to an object by being associated with a sense, and the sense just is a description, then the description can't be false of the object. That doesn't make any sense. If that's a description that's fixing the reference of Aristotle, then it's a priori that Aristotle is the teacher of Alexander the Great, who was born in Stagira. Yeah, that's all right. You see, that, 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 that's what Craig is a kind of wise. But that seems to be a mistake. Frege's account implies that this is a priori. Aristotle was a teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira. But it's not a priori. It might turn out to be a mistake. What Searle's catching there is that idea that names are just tags. They don't really descriptively identify the object. So if you take... Um, uh, this approach, Searle says, you can explain why Tully is Tully is uh, a priori and analytic, but Tully is Cicero is not. You can explain Frege's puzzle 
of um, uninformative and informative identities. That's how it's claimed. Not quite obvious how that goes. Um, I'm sorry, what's happening? Oh, yes, right. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Frege's approach explains why Tully is Tully is an informative and Tully is Cicero is not. Because you have the same description associated with fixing the reference of Tully here and the same description that you associate with Tully on the right. And you have the same description fixing the reference both times. Therefore, um, uh, the identity is going to be uninformative. If you yourself associate different descriptions with Tully and Cicero, then the description is going to be uninformative. Well, that's Frege's account. Isn't that what I said? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad someone's following this. <laughs> okay. Let me take this from the top. Um, if you, as an individual speaker, associate one description with Polly on the left there, and the same description with Polly on the right in A, right, then that is uninformative. Put up your hand if you think it's uninformative. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, with B, if you as an individual speaker associate a different description with Tully than you do with Cicero, then the identity is... Uh, put up your hand if you think it's uninformative. Informative? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's Frege's picture. And the great advantage of that approach is it can explain why A is a, a priori and analytic and B is not. Yeah? But now, the drawback is, the thing that's getting you that advantage there also is implying that remarks like this, Aristotle is a teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira, is also implying that that kind of remark is a priori and analytic. And what I've just been suggesting and what Cyril is saying is, remarks like that are never a priori and analytic. It could always turn out that you were wrong about that kind of thing, just as it could turn out that you were wrong in thinking that Mitt Romney said that corporations are people. You might just make a mistake. You're still tagging the object, all right. So in Searle's picture, what's hooking up the name to the object is this loose, indeterminate, socially generated cluster. It's a big bag of descriptions generated by the society as a whole. And any one description in the bag could be dropped. You don't have to, no one description in the bag has a privileged position. All you say is, the name refers to whatever meets all or most or weighted most of all those descriptions. Any one of them might turn out to be wrong. So Cyril gets it right that um, it's not a priori or analytic that Aristotle is a teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira. Cyril nails that. He explains why that's uh, not a priori. And Cyril's approach also has the advantage that it can explain how anything that meets most of the cluster of descriptions, uh, how, how there could turn out that you could say such a thing as Homer doesn't exist, or um, Aristotle doesn't exist. There's no such person. Because it might turn out that there was nothing that met all or most of that cluster of descriptions. It just turned out there was no such thing meeting that. So the name would still have meaning, but it wouldn't be referring to anything. So those are two advantages of Searle's theory. Uh-huh. That's an interesting issue. Can can Cyril move backward from the name to the descriptions? Well, 
I mean, I guess my first feeling is that um, that would mean that the Miller's daughter, uh, if she just read Cell, should have been able to figure out his name. But that can't be right. It, yeah? <laughs> is that a soundtrack? <laughs> <laughs> right. um, you see what I mean? Um, the thing is that the bag of descriptions might be pretty big. Um, I mean, if it, it helps me to... <laughs> right, there's the bag of descriptions, right? So it's got all, got all those descriptions. It's got all those descriptions in it. But they may not be... I mean, they typically won't be exhaustive. I mean, Mitt Romney may have all kinds of hidden lives, hidden secrets that are not in this bag. Yeah? So there may be the Mitt Romney known only to his family and closest friends. Yeah, quite different bag of descriptions over here. Just from the object, you know, just from the object, you can't work back to which bag of descriptions it is. Yeah, so I, I think, I mean, it's an interesting question. And I see why you say it, because I, I said the individual is just generating all those descriptions. But um, any of us who has a hidden life that may, maybe people don't know about, I said, you know, family and closest friends, but maybe even they don't know. So no one in the society is a knowledge of that collection of descriptions. But they still may be true of you. Okay. See, you can't tell just by looking at the object which bag of descriptions are going to be radiating in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, two. I think that's what he's thinking. Um, I think it, it really is an interesting and difficult question, though, whether that really makes sense. Because um, what matters for informativeness is what's going on in the head of the individual. Yeah? There might be a different bag of, I mean, if, if I can now use this as a bag of descriptions associated with Tully and a bag of descriptions associated with Cicero. These are both socially generated. Um, they might be different. That's what you began by saying, and that's what Cyril would say. They are different bags of descriptions, different dossiers. But um, that doesn't seem to me to tell you anything about what's going to be informative or uninformative at the level of the individual, because you don't know which descriptions the individual knows to be true of Tully or knows to be true of Cicero. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. I and mean, it's a puzzle how you would get from that remark about what's going on in the social language as a whole to the psychology of the individual. Because informativeness and uninformative seem to have to do with the psychology of the individual. Yeah. Uh, one, two. You, are you still? Uh, what was the first one? Uh, <laughs> good question. I said cells account had two advantages. I think I was only saying it had one advantage. I may have cut, oh no, there are two advantages, sorry. Um, one is um, why this kind of remark isn't a priori or analytic. That's all right? It's not. And Cell explains that and Frege doesn't. Yeah, the, uh, if, I, if that's not plain as day, I haven't explained it correctly. Uh, is that plain as day? It's plain but not as day. <laughs> come back to that in a minute. Let, let, let me take a, and come back to that if you can tell me what's problematic about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay, oh, it's only analytic conditionally on that, that being the description you associate with the name Aristotle. If the description you're using to fix the reference of the name uh, is the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira, then it's a priori that Ar 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 Aristotle is the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira. I mean, you might need to add, if such a person exists. Yeah? But given that, 
Yeah. It, it has to be for your eye. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh huh. I think, I think this is fair. You should look at the text and check that I'm right about this. But I think it is fair to say that the way Searle is trying to account for that is to say it's the same bag of descriptions that is associated with two uses of the name Tully in the society. That's what explains why that's uninformative. And it's a different bag of descriptions, as someone said, actually, associated with the name Tully, as is associated with the name Cicero. But it, that's what explains why this is informative, the Tully is Cicero. The Tully is Tully? Well, it's the same bag of descriptions. I see what you mean. It, it's not that any one description is fixing the reference, right? But that this bag of descriptions, that's the only mechanism there is for fixing the reference. Is whatever meets a good majority of this lot, whichever ones it is. And so it's the same mechanism fixing the reference of Tully both times. He would say it is not informative. That Tully is Tully. He would agree with Frege on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, two. That's right. I mean, um, if, for Frege, if you take, if you associate the um, description, the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira with the name Aristotle, then this will be analytic. You just read that off from the meaning of the name. If I associate um, um, the last great philosopher of antiquity as my uh, description for Aristotle, as my description that fixes the reference of Aristotle, then this will not be analytic. Yeah, because it could be that. Um, the last great philosopher of antiquity was not the teacher of Alexander the Great in Bonus to Nira. He is okay with that. He, that's what he says about variations in sense can happen, but he says sternly it wouldn't happen in a properly regulated language. Right? Uh, you, we should be keeping things in line, but it seems like um, if, if we don't, which we actually don't, he says, uh, then um, it'll be relative to an individual, what's analytic and what isn't. Uh, one, two, yeah. Yes. Mitt is Mitt Romney, yeah. He's not just anybody, yeah. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. I mean, I agree, we do use names like that. Um, you can say, but this is Shakespeare. Uh, if someone says something or whatever, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so what do you say about that? Um, I mean, it's presumably the same bag of descriptions associated both times with Mitt and Mitt Romney. Yeah. Right. That could happen, and then it would, in a way, it would be easier because we call a mitt when it's just <laughs> when it's just family, um, uh, but we call it we, we say Mitt Romney when we're referring to the political figure. Yeah. The trouble with that is there's going to be all kinds of overlap between these two bags in that kind of situation. So it's not going to be a cleanly distinguished set of dossiers. Yeah? Because after all, you know, what about your second cousin? You, you, you see what I mean? Well, Mitt, Mitt is not just family, exactly, because he really gets most of his information about Mitt from the papers. But he's also a little bit of an insider. You, you see what I mean? Um, yeah. That's right. I mean, 
It may be that they don't really make sense. It may be that they're really uninformative. It's rather that, um, I mean, the importance of them is not so much in what they explicitly state as in, you know, why would you say that? You, you see what I mean? If I say, look, Shakespeare is Shakespeare, or if I say, total war is total war, um, then it's not, or, you know, victory is victory, then it's not that these are informative identities exactly. It's just that in my saying them, I'm trying to remind you of what we're talking about here. You, you, you see what I mean? So sometimes it could be that stating an uninformative identity is actually having a valuable point, but not because it's communicating something substantive. So that, that, but I, I think the situation is interesting and complicated with these kind of examples. Well, things are hotting up. Um, I, I do want to get to the end here, but can we just have one, two, three, and, and uh, just say this, and ask you a question quickly, and I'll try to give a short answer rather than going on for half an hour. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's that notion of properly in the bag uh, that's hard to make out. I mean, if you think about what the ground floor phenomena of language here are, you know, main, namely people being asked to volunteer descriptions, it's a bit difficult to know what's proper, properly in the bag and what's not. You, you, you see what I mean? You, you might be able to draw some such distinction, but it's, it's not trivial. Um, yeah. Yeah, they look, uh, the way I draw the picture, they look very similar. So this is Searle's picture, and this is Frege's. Yeah, the difference, the big difference is, this is generated by an individual, whereas in Searle's picture, this is generated by the society that's using the name. Yeah, so Frege's picture is a Humpty Dumpty picture. I get to decide what sense my sign has. Searle's picture is the exact opposite of that. You just have to hold yourself responsible to this publicly generated set of descriptions. Uh, last one. It's a very natural idea to have. If, you, if you've come across Wittgenstein's idea that what all games have in common is not any one thing. You can play a game of cards. You can have a swimming contest. They're all games, but what do they have in common? Do they all involve water? No. Do they all involve teams? No. Um, there's no one thing games have in common, just crisscrossing resemblances. So you might think that about um, these bags of descriptions. Yeah. Um, it, the, it really is an interesting idea and worth pursuing that. Um, the only quick comment I would have on that is that when Wittgenstein was talking about family resemblances, he was talking about the things we are talking about, you know, the games out there in the world that we're talking about. Whereas here, we're not talking, uh, I mean, the thing we're talking about is Mitt Romney or whatever it is, yeah? And, um, I mean, of course, Mitt has family resemblances to the rest of his family, but that's not what you mean, right? You're talking about something at the level of sense, yeah? And so, so it's just different to what Wittgenstein meant. Wittgenstein was some, talking about something at the level of reference, at the level of what we're talking about. So that's just something to bear in mind. Nonetheless, what you say is worth following that up, I think. Okay, I think we've only have um, two minutes left. So um, I am going to uh, just cut to the chase on my um, killer example here. Um, I looked, uh, I, I, uh, this is a remark from uh, uh, the great UCLA philosopher, David Kaplan. He, uh, he says, and I think that, that, that if you know Kaplan, Kaplan loves a kind of vaudeville crosstalk. Um, and you can just imagine 
the, the, you get an insight into the home life of a great philosopher here. My mother's primary care physician is Dr. Shapiro. He referred her to a specialist, another Dr. Shapiro, as it happened. My mother reported her gratitude to Dr. Shapiro for sending her to Dr. Shapiro and compared the virtues of Dr. Shapiro to those of Dr. Shapiro in a blithe piece of discourse, clearly oblivious to the homonymy. I was racing to keep up, which I was strangely able to do. Now, you can imagine that situation, right? Now, uh, in that case, the identity, Dr. Shapiro, one Dr. Shapiro seems to have a different sense to the other. But actually, out there in the community, there might be only one Dr. Shapiro. Maybe the mother made a mistake. Maybe she thought this was a specialist coming into the room, and it was actually the same old Dr. Shapiro without his hat. That could happen. Yeah? Uh, I suppose that happens. Then I've got just one, a sign, Dr. Shapiro, with just one bag of descriptions in the community being associated with it. When I say Dr. Shapiro, did, and was, is Dr. Shapiro really a more empathetic human being than Dr. Shapiro, I say? Yeah? Then I'm actually tapping into the same bag of descriptions twice. I just don't realize that I am. That could happen. I will give more examples next time. But for right now, the point is that th this account of um, uh, the meaning of a name seems incapable of uh, recognizing that it could happen informatively. That you suddenly say, it's the same man. Dr. Shapiro is Dr. Shapiro. And that could be informative. More on this on Wednesday. Okay, thanks.